love you. New Life Church, what's happening? How are you doing today? Hey, can we take a moment to pray together? Um, I don't know what I'm going to say today. I mean, I have a sermon plan. I've got notes up on here. But I've just come to know that the most powerful thing I ever could do is be fully submitted to the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. that wants to rest and abide and use a broken yeah. person like me. Think about this. The church of Jesus Christ, which we are all a part of, even if you don't believe that this Christian thing is real, even if you're just here because you're dating someone and you're trying to play the game, even if you're discouraged because of what you're going through, this whole thing we call church was started 2,000 years ago from a man who died on a cross, he rose from the grave, and then when he left, the church was born. And then there was a whole bunch of people who were sitting in a room, they were waiting on this thing called the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then a guy who didn't have an iPad, who didn't have a PowerPoint presentation, who didn't have a slick guitarist playing behind him, got up and he preached this sermon coming from his soul that helped birth the church. And so my prayer for you today is that we would be connected on, to the power of the Holy Spirit, which wants to do a new work in us. So if you could pray with me, so if you could just stand really quickly, if you could grab the hand of the person next to you, it's okay, they love you, I think they do, Come on. I hope they do, and let's take a moment to pray, okay? Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your church. Yes. And we think about through thousands of years what this gathering looked like. Sometimes it looked like meeting in the catacombs because that's the only place that was safe. Maybe that was looking like just sitting in a huddle, praying right before we were thrust into a coliseum and devoured and killed for sport. Sometimes it looked like an underground church in China. Sometimes it looks like a great cathedral that took yeah. hundreds of years to build because man was trying to figure out how do we encapsulate heaven on earth? And so we built a cathedral. This has looked so many different ways, but the common thread is broken people gathering together yeah. to, to hear a word from our Heavenly Father. And today, we want to do the same. We thank you, Lord God, that every single time we open up your word and give attention to it, it can change yeah. our lives. Yeah. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to have your way in this place today. Holy Spirit, would yeah. you convict our hearts yeah. with areas of our life that we haven't been walking in alignment and help us to see that surrendering our logic to your will can actually create a more powerful us. You want to walk with us. You yeah. want to give us yeah. power. Yeah. Your word said that you came, that we may have life yeah. and have it to the full. Yeah, you saved us from hell. Yeah, you saved us from our sins. But you want us to walk each and every day with our favor that can only come from you. Favor yeah. that can connect the times when you picked us up from a failure the times when you brought us through, when we didn't have yeah. enough money yeah. to make it through, yeah. and then we get to look at our challenges that we face today and say that the same God that carried us through our past will carry us into our future. We thank you for the gift of prayer. We thank you for the gift of your church. We thank you for what you will do in this house today. And we pray, Lord God, that our Mondays will be different because of what we've done today. That our families will be different on Thursday because of what has happened in this moment today. We pray these things in the resurrected name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. You can grab a seat. I think that's all I got. Have a great day. I think I ran out of Holy Spirit two minutes in. This isn't a good thing. Hey, have you ever... Um, seen a friend get the thing they've been praying for? Have you ever been to a housewarming party and you know that your friend got rejected for the home loan three times and you're sitting in the home and 
You're like, you're tearing up because you know what it took to get there. Or have you ever uh, seen a friend drive the broke down car and then they got the new one and you're like, oh, look at that. And then you just feel like you're cheering them on. Have you ever been at a child dedication or been at the hospital for the person who said that they were infertile and they couldn't have kids? Like, have you ever seen someone get the very thing they prayed for? As we were worshiping, I got this picture of the time I started bawling in my car on a normal Tuesday going to work. I was watching, I was getting ready to hop out of my truck. This was like, let's say 2017. And uh, this car rolled up, and this husband was dropping his wife off for work. But before she got out, she was hurrying, putting her makeup on, and that's when I lost it. My friend, we'll call her Jane, just a few years before, I was talking to her, and she told me, hey, I am the girl that's always friends with the girl everyone wants to date. Men aren't attracted to me like that. She was so convinced that she was always going to be the bridesmaid but never be the bride, she had started compromising in her life because she believed that she would never get love the way she dreamt about it. Shortly after that conversation, this dude came out of nowhere, seemingly, and he pursued her the right way, fell in love with her the right way, gave her one ring, gave her another ring, cried when she came down the altar, and now here she is putting makeup on a Tuesday, living in the normal of the very thing she had once prayed for. And that's the feeling I've been getting all morning. I was cooking my kids breakfast today, and I just had this realization that when I was six years old and gave my life to Christ, and when I was 12 years old and started reading the Bible for myself, I never thought, I never thought in a thousand years that I would have a friend ask me to come to his church and teach the Bible. I never thought that would be possible, and so I'm grateful today. I'm grateful to see you because I remember meeting my friend, Green Beret, Keith Waller, this man, this myth, this legend of a guy who had this dream of leaving his dream job to starting this dream called a church, and now you're sitting in it on a Sunday. And so I am beyond grateful to be here with you today. And I just want you to know that what you have is special. And we live in a society where we take things that are amazing and we treat them as common, and then we wonder why we can't feel like progress in our life, where we can't feel accomplishment. Because the moment we get something, we look for the next thing versus having a deeper appreciation for what is in our hands. And so, if new life is your church, then my prayer is for you is that you'll make this your family. Because that's what church is supposed to be. It's supposed to feel like a reunion on Sunday. It's supposed to feel like, oh man, there's someone who knows my stuff and they still like me. Woo! You ever had someone who knows your stuff and still like you? Now that's the greatest feeling ever. It's the greatest feeling ever. I had some friends of mine, they were my roommates in college, and they knew all of me and they still loved me anyways. And whenever I get on the phone with them, it's like, oh man, I feel seen and known. And that's what God's church is supposed to be all about. Today, we're going to be in the book of Philippians. So if you have your Bible with you, I'd love for you to turn there. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. And today, the title for this sermon is, It Costs You Too Much. Today, we're going to be talking about your pride. And we're going to be talking about what it costs you in your life. Your pride is killing everything. It's this virus that's killing everything in your life, and you can't even see it coming. Pride is one of those things that you can see in everybody else, but it's so hard to identify in yourself because you got explanations for your pride. You got caveats for yours, but you got no grace for anybody else. And today, we're going to talk about it. We're going to let God's Word come right at your heart with it. Because if you can uproot pride through the vaccine of humility, then there's nothing you can't do. 
you will walk onto a field of battle and say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that goes against the armies of the Lord? Like David, he was able to see a giant as a small little man because he knew how big his God was. Everyone else was quaking in fear, but he could see what others couldn't see because he walked in humility with his God. Two men went to the uh, promised land and came back with a good report. Ten of them came back with a good report, but with a big old butt. And the Israelites almost didn't even go into the promised land, the thing that God had promised them because of a pandemic of fear, because people made it all about them. Pride will make it all about you. And so today, let's look at God's word through Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul is writing this letter, the book of Philippians, to the church at Philippi. This letter is a thank you letter because Paul, while free in his spirit, he is locked up in chains. And he's locked up in chains. And how many of you know when hard times hit, you find out who the real ones are? How many of you know when you got the new boat, it's easy to have a friend. But when the boat goes away, you find out who's still coming over for dinner. Paul has hard times, and although he's free in the spirit, he's locked up in prison. And of all the churches, he has started, supported, shepherded. The church at Philippi is the one who's supporting him while he's in chains. You see, in Roman times, your prison experience would vary vastly based on your support system. If you had people who would send money for you, send money to make sure you could eat, drink, whatever, your experience was vastly different than if you didn't have your support network. And while he was locked up in chains, the church at Philippi gave generously to sustain him so he was able to write the New Testament while still locked up. He's writing this letter as a thank you. Have you ever tried to write a thank you note to someone who did something for you in a way you could never repay them? So, he decides to give them the cheat codes of the faith. He decides to hook them up with every spiritual blessing he could give them, and he's throwing it in there in the book of Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 2, he's trying to tell them the cheat code of how do you inoculate pride in your life. You see, pride is a virus. Pride has cost me so much in my life and I know the only way I can conquer it is through humility. And so let me just share with you quickly four things that pride does for you. And it happens to all of us in our lives, but I think I got a picture 
So check out that. Does anyone know what that is? Okay. That is in Israel at the monument, the National Monument for the Holocaust in Israel. And so that is at the Holocaust Museum. And you go through the Holocaust Museum. And at the end, you walk into this room. And in the back of the room are books. And there are thousands of books around this room. And it has, I think, two million of the names of Jewish men and women who were killed in the Holocaust. And when you walk through the Holocaust Museum, all of a sudden I realize that calling Hitler a madman is letting him off the hook. That man was not crazy. He was evil, but he wasn't crazy. And how did he galvanize a nation to commit what we now would all agree in this room was an atrocity through pride. How did he get them? Through pride. Started a little music station on the radio, and it'd be great music for 80% of the time, and then every once in a while, get on there. Hey, we're a glorious nation. Hey, we're built for so much more. Hey, do you know that the German identity is one of richness and power? <laughs> Here's a little joke about the Jews. A little joke here. A little pride here. Joke here, pride here, pride, 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 pride. We have a glorious mandate to take over Europe. And before you know it, people did the very thing they never thought they'd ever do because of pride. Because of pride. Pride's a virus. Let me share with you four things that pride will take from you in your life. I think I got that picture of my cute boy. That's my son. Joshua, I got four kids, eight, six, four, and three, and he's the one. He's the crazy one. If any of y'all are looking to adopt a child, just come see me after church. <laughs> I know I'll get him back at the end of the day, you know. <laughs> We've been trying everywhere we go. But he's pointing at you, just so you know, we're talking about you today. Not your neighbor, not your friend, not the person who's at home who should hear this sermon. I'm talking about you. Pride is a virus. Remember, um, Keith didn't give me an itemized list of y'all's problems. He didn't tell me what y'all are going through. So if it comes like I'm in your living room or like I was in the argument you had in the car and you thought no one heard it on Bluetooth, just know that's Holy Spirit. It's not me. Okay? Pride is a virus. What does it do? It sabotages comparison to exalt or disqualify myself. But Joel, comparison's bad. No, it's not. Comparison's only bad because your pride's all up in it. Did you know that comparison could be one of the greatest inspirational tools to grow you as a person? Because comparison will allow you to say, man, if God could do it through them, he could do it through me. But what will we do with comparison? Why did that guy get the job? You know he's nothing but a kiss up. You know he doesn't do his job. He's just good at playing the game and playing the part. Why do we say that? Because pride will make us think that promotion is a finite source versus something that comes from God. And so you're out here thinking that it's only you versus the other person, but God's like, man, I'm the God of the third option. I open doors where everyone else can see as walls. But pride will sabotage what you could be cheering someone on with because you see them as competition. And it does it every single day. Pride shortcuts the power of story by weaponizing assumptions. Woo! I love that one. Weaponizing assumptions. Think about this. Pride will make you think that you know everything about someone else without stopping to ask the whole story. Pride shrinks my perspective to make it all about me. Shrinks my perspective to make it all about me. Uh, when I was in Charlotte, so my 10-second story is, grew up in a Christian home, gave my life to Christ at the age of six. Uh, went to University of South Carolina, got a degree in economics because I wanted to go in the business world, even though my dad said, hey, there's a call in your life, you should probably go to Bible school. And so I didn't listen. I went to business school. He said, you should probably go work at a church. I was like, nah, man, I want to go make this money. So I started in the banking industry. And five years, eight months, 24 days in, God pulled me out of that and pulled me into church. And I've been a pastor for about 12 years now. And I remember 
when I got to this new bank with a new promotion, me and this other dude started the same week. And we went to the same introduction lunch with our boss. And in my head, I'm like, oh, I'm so much more qualified than this dude. I'm better than him. But then, every week, for the first eight months, my boss was always at his office and never at mine. The branch he took over was about three miles from mine. You literally had to pass by mine to get to his. And I was like, why? Why is that boss always there? He's probably doing better than me. She probably doesn't like me. And then eight months, I wove this whole narrative that I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't smart enough, that I was being looked over. And, and then one day she walks into my office on a random Tuesday with her boss. Walks into my office on a Tuesday with her boss. And they're talking to the tellers. And I'm like, what are they saying? Is this the last day? What's going to happen? And then while she's talking to someone on my team, her boss pulls me into my office and closes the door. And he says, hey, Jill has nothing but great things to say about you. She says that she never has to come by your office because you actually care for your team. And then all of a sudden he asked me this. He says, hey, would you ever want to have her job one day? I thought I was going to get fired. I thought I wasn't doing a good job because my pride made me think everything was about me and then it shrunk my perspective where I was being chained from something I should have been encouraged by. I should have been able to say, well, maybe she doesn't have to check on me. That's why she's come to my friend. But I couldn't see that. And your pride is creating a narrative that is shrinking your perspective and making it all about you. They don't like you. No, that's not true. They're just going through a lot of stuff, so they can't smile at you every day. Well, why don't they call me back? Because they're going through it. And when you break the back of pride, your perspective will help you see, it ain't all about me. Is this helping you? Is this good? These lights are hard, so I'm, I'm just assuming y'all are, are smiling at me. Uh, pride stops me from saying I'm sorry. Pride stops me from saying I'm sorry. When I was 10 years old, I moved from San Diego, California to Hilton Head Island, South, South Carolina. San Diego, California is a melting pot in every single way you could ever imagine it, racially. Uh, mindset, religion, uh, thought, e everything's like this melting pot. And then I go from there to South Carolina, and it's a whole lot different. <laughs> Couldn't be any more different. And I remember my parents telling me I was going to private school. I was like, I don't want to go to private school, kids. Them kids are crazy. My first day of school, Going into the bathroom, I sat there in the stall, and the first time I experienced racism. I can tell you his name. He thinks he didn't know. He thinks I don't know who it was, but I know who it was. He stood at the bathroom door while I was in the stall and said, hey, there's a school where you, you people go. Why don't you go there? You would love it much more. In sixth grade. Side note, how does a sixth grader know to say that stuff? It's passed down. And so, parent, whatever you actually believe, no, you impart it to the next generation. Because you don't teach your kids anything. You impart things to your children. Because if you taught it to them, you could say class is on, session is out, and then go home and everything's good. But we impart to our children. And this young man, oh man, he just knew that it was his job to call the herd and push out everyone who wasn't like him. So I don't hold it against him, but he said that. And so that created a fear in me of who am I going to sit with at lunch. About four days in, Eric Dryley said, hey, man, come sit with me. And we called Eric Dryley Giggles. Uh, uh, he's a little chunky man, and whenever he'd always laugh with his whole body. <laughs> and then like 35 seconds after he stopped laughing, his body was still shaking, you know, <laughs> call him Giggles. And, and me and Giggles, uh, we ended up carpooling together every day. My last name is Delph. His last name is Dryly. And so in the yearbook, from 6th through 12th grade, we're next to each other. That first year, 
when I got in the car for carpool picture day for the yearbook, I was wearing the same exact shirt he was wearing. And so here we come out looking like a cult out of the same car, wearing the same clothes. And everyone's like, oh, that's so cute. Do you guys call each other? We're like, no, we didn't. And Eric Dryley was my first friend who pushed past whatever was in that room, in that Christian school, and saw me for me. Um, Eric Dryley, the age of 39, passed away in April. And uh, I went to go to his uh, funeral. And when I was at the wake, I realized that I couldn't tell you the last time I talked to him. I was meeting his wife for the first time. And all I could think about is somewhere along the line, someone who saw me, our relationship got interrupted, and I am 100% sure it's because of pride. Someone's feelings got hurt. Someone had a disagreement, and before you know it, a relationship that was literally life-giving for me was ended before we even knew it. And pride will stop you from saying, I'm sorry. It's better for you to scrub a little bit of pride with your brother or sister so you can keep having a relationship because you know what? The generations after you, they won't even know that side of the family. And so for some of you adults in the room, your sermon talk away, takeaway points today is call your brother and say, I'm sorry. Drive back to New Jersey and say, hey, Lennox. I don't know if that's your brother's name. Hey, Lennox, just want to let you know, in 1997, I cussed you out at your wife's wedding because I hate your wife. And I still hate your wife, but I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, baby steps, try it. Um, pride is a virus. Today, let's look through God's word, and I just want to share with you four simple ways you can inoculate the virus of pride. Four simple ways you can inoculate the virus of pride. So here's something that pride does. First thing, humility, well, pride will tear everything down, but humility fights for unity. Humility fights for unity. Got this picture over here. All right. Story time with Keith Waller. Let me give you a story time with Keith Waller. Uh, so after I found out Keith was a Green Beret, I went and hung out with him for a day. And um, uh, you don't know this, but I got a whole Evernote of all the stuff I've learned from you. And I, I can speak Keith Waller all day. So um, I asked him, tell me about your first deployment uh, to Afghanistan versus your second one. And he said, hey, the first one was like the wild, wild west. We were kicking doors down, taking names. And in the province they were working in, within six weeks, they were able to restore, like, peace. And they high-fived each other. They chest-bumped each other. Like, hey, we're Green Berets. We do this thing. And the moment they left from deployment, within a few months, that place that was a place of peace became a place of disorder once again. Because they hadn't figured out how to work with the locals. They hadn't figured out how to partner with them, and that is a part of the, the main mission set of Green Berets. And so when they went back the second time, they said, hey, how do we keep raising up the Afghans to understand how to take care of their own? And then it became all about who they empower versus if I get to kick the door down or not. And then years after they left that second deployment, that place was still safe because they found out how to work together and train and impart the people with the security measures they needed to keep their people safe. And so what they had to do is scrub the pride of saying, I'm a Green Beret, I know what to do. And they had to walk in humility to say, hey, let's do this thing together. I can't do this without you. And in doing that, they were able to empower way more people to keep that area safe. And you only can do that when you fight for unity. See what Paul says right here in Philippians 1 and 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Humility fights for unity. 
in your life, where are you fighting for unity? If you don't see in your life you're fighting for unity, then there's probably some pride. There's probably some pride. Yeah, my boss should come to me on that because I know the solution. So you're withholding it versus, hey, boss, I want us to work together. So here's something I think we could do. Hey, I really disagree with that decision, but you know what? It's not killing anybody. It's not morally wrong. And even though I have a difference of opinion, that may mean that's a preference. And so many times, believer, we have tethered relationships with people because we've allowed preferences to trump everything. But humility fights for unity. Another passage of scripture in Ephesians says, make every effort to keep the unity of spirit through the bonds of peace. And you can't fight for humility while you're holding on to pride. And so, where in your life do you need to fight for unity? Like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. You can do so much more in your life when you do it together. When you do it together. It's not all about you. Self-reliance is great, but that'll only get you so far in life. But the moment you can understand how to walk in unity with others, oh, wow, you're unlocking the power of God. Humility fights for unity. Second thing, this one is kind of hard for me, but I'm going to say it out loud, okay? Humility challenges our motives. Humility challenges our motives. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Humility challenges our motives. There is a assumption that you probably need to shift in your mindset, which is this. My motives are pure. My motives are pure. Because what humility does puts a question mark on, on that. Are, 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 are my motives pure? What's my real reason about talking, talking to that guy who, who's the millionaire, who's got the beach house? What's my real intention of being nice to the boss's kids when they come into the office? What's my real motive with saying that second hello to that person at the gym, huh? What's my real motive? Because if you can challenge your motives, then you will walk in humility because you are not always right. Your motives are not always pure. You are not always the innocent lamb surrounded by ravenous wolves. You have to challenge your motives. Well, why would I do that? Because when you challenge your motives, you actually can let God work in your life. Because here's the thing. Pride and progress are never linked. You can never progress forward in your life while you're holding on to pride. Friday morning I was uh, working out, and I don't do CrossFit. I survive it. Uh, my goal is to beat any 75-year-old man who's in the room. And other than that, I'm just trying to keep up. I leave them soccer moms alone because they got too much rage, got too much anger. All them kids taking too much from them, so they're there to lift weight, so I just leave them alone. And so Friday morning, I hadn't been in the gym in about, hmm, let's say, three weeks. And I was really nervous about walking back in because I know I'm not consistent. And after I survived the workout, and it seemed to be that it was the workout time where every single superhuman person came to the gym, so I realized how slow I was, you know. It's really bad when someone's wearing a parka, a parka and their six-pack is still showing through. It's like, dang, that's just excessive. And so I asked them, I said, hey, how, how do you stay consistent? And I struggled asking that question because I had to throw up my pride and say, hey, guys, y'all know I haven't been here in about a month. And I asked them, I said, hey, how, how, how do you stay consistent? And they started sharing all of these nuggets that I hadn't been thinking about. And oftentimes in life, it's not the new thing that gives you a revelation. It's the old thing that you need to reinforce 
that gives you the revelation through application. And so they start telling me, hey, well, if you make it negotiable, then you already lost the war. Other soccer mom got up and said, I can't do anything in my day until I get my workout in. That's how she sounded. No, she wasn't 6'4", she was about 5'1". And, and all of a sudden, they started sharing all these things that, like, I was like, oh, I need that. But pride would have kept me silent from asking them. And your pride will keep you silent from becoming a student and saying, hey, how, how can I learn? But if you don't challenge your motives, hey, I'm trying to look like I'm better than I am right now. <laughs> hey, um, I'm trying to position myself because I think this person has an opportunity right now. Hey, I'm trying to overcompensate to my children because I'm too afraid to say I'm sorry for yelling at them a little bit ago. Man, one of the best things I've had to do is say, oh, dang, I got to go back to my kid and say, hey, um, I know I was trying to teach you a lesson, but I was really just frustrated, and <laughs> I'm really sorry. But humility will challenge your motives with why you do what you do. Yeah. Hey, humility will say, I can't talk to that girl again. Hmm? Oh, we're not going to talk about sexuality in church? Humility will say, no, she's not a friend. Humility will say, mm, don't want me to walk over there. Humility will say, hmm, I got to get home from work early today. Humility will challenge your motives. Humility walks in purpose. Humility walks in purpose. This is one of my favorite parts of this passage, and it says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Jesus had a mindset with how he operated in the earth each and every day. And you know you can have that same mindset? You maybe can't be Jesus, but you can have his mindset. It says this, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. What? What? It says this, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Wait, the son of God didn't walk around the earth like a prince? He didn't walk around like he was owed respect? but he walked around like a servant? Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Humility walks in purpose. Jesus knew his purpose on the earth, and he couldn't allow his crown to hold him back from his purpose. So he was willing to surrender what was rightfully his so he could walk in purpose. Yeah, you own the business, but do you, do you work it every day like you're a servant? Or you work it every day like you're supposed to be the one who served? Here's the crazy part. If you work it like a servant, then everyone else will hustle to make you a king. Humility walks in purpose. Jesus made himself nothing so he could do the very thing that only he could do in the earth. Believer, do you know that if you walk in purpose, there's a level of submission to the call of God in your life? That means you can't walk in all the perks that you think you're due? So that means that I got to get there before my team does. That means... When I get home, I got to serve my wife. My wife is amazing, y'all. And the thing that's crazy is I always prayed for a wife. I never knew that God would actually give me a helpmate. I never knew that. So pre-Kelly, I was always discounting my love because I felt like I had to save someone because that's how I would get love. And then God did this crazy gift and he gave me the wife I didn't know how to pray for. You know, God will not just give you what you need, but he'll give you the answer to the prayer that you're not even brave enough to pray for. Well, that's an amazing thing. But I can't just see that every day as a, well, she's going to serve me. She's going to serve me. I got to figure out how do I fight to serve her as well. 
And so marriage is a covenant of mutual submission. That's what the Bible says. Each of you should submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Yeah, the man's the head. He is the head, but guess what? It's very easy to be led by someone when they're finding ways to serve you. And vice versa. Humility walks in purpose. Finally, humility is exalted by God. Here's a cheat code in life. You walk in humility, there's more opportunities for you than you ever thought possible. You walk in humility, then people who don't even like you will make a way for you. You walk in humility, people will tell you things they've never told anyone, which will shortcut decades off of your life. So you can walk in every area that God has for you. Kmart was the Walmart of a few decades ago. And one day, a young Sam Walton sat in the office of Kmart and said, I'd love to meet with the CEO. I've got 42 stores in Arkansas, and I want to grow it. And he sat there, legend has it, for three days. And the CEO didn't have time for him, didn't have time for him. And then he said, hey, this guy's, this guy's waiting. I'll sit with him. And because he was so hungry, he was so humble, I said, hey, I just want to learn how you do it. And Kmart the CEO said, hey, our goal is this. We negotiate with every single product that we have to get the lowest price possible so we can, we can beat our competition. And Sam Walton's like, what? Everyday low prices? Ooh, I haven't thought about that. And he's writing these notes, he's writing these notes, he's writing these notes. And because someone hadn't asked him before, the CEO of Kmart unlocked their whole strategy just because someone was hungry. I'll pay you 50 bucks right now if you can drive to Kmart can't but if you close your eyes and drive in a mile you'll find a walmart somewhere right <laughs> humility is always exalted here's the amazing thing about god's word is god's truth is objective so even if you don't believe it you can still walk in some of the promises of it humility is exalted by god listen to this in philippians 2 jesus walked in humility and this is what happened therefore god exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father because Jesus walked in humility, God gave him an upgrade. Because Jesus walked in humility, he was able to free us from our sins. Because Jesus walked in humility, even when he was hungry in a desert on day 38, he didn't compromise his purpose to the temptations of the enemy because he knew what it would cost him and he knew what God would allow him to walk in if he stayed faithful. Here's the most amazing thing about this whole word I just shared with you today, is if you just leave some room to allow the Holy Spirit to actually have your whole heart, God will do this whole work in you. God will do this whole work in you where he'll open up doors, he'll make you say sorry, he'll have you learning from people that you thought was against you, we just moved to Charleston two years ago, and uh, I met this one dude, and uh, uh, he's real cocky, and I hate cocky people because my discernment says they're arrogant. You know, that discernment I was talking about, oh, the judgmental side of me. And um, uh, God started saying, hey, uh, ask that guy out to lunch. And I was like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to ask him out to lunch. He's, he's probably racist. I even said that to myself. And so, so we go to this old bar in Charleston for lunch and right as he's opening the door for me he's like hey brother he's putting his hand on my shoulder as we're walking in he's like hey just a few years ago you wouldn't have been allowed in these doors and I'm like he is a racist I should go and, 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 and I heard that 
and I wanted to cancel him, but God said, no, 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 no. There's something more, there's something more, there's something more. And we sat down at this lunch, and we were talking, and, and then God broke through in something with us. And you know what? This guy has turned into someone who over the last six months, every day, he sends me prayer requests. He, he'll call me every other week and say, hey, man, you should, you should do this real estate deal. He's trying to, like, advise me financially, and he's gifted that way. But all of that would have been held back if I allowed pride to steal something from me. Because you know what? Your pride can't make any room for someone else's brokenness. Oh, you think the grace of God is just for you? No. The grace of God is something you receive, and then you're able to lavishly give it to someone else. So... My friend, my brother in Christ, yeah, you little racist. But guess what? The, the grace of Christ covers over all that. You know, you got a friend who's a little alcoholic, okay. Grace of God covers over all that. You got a son or a daughter who's having their hot girl summer, who's building their testimony out in Vegas, and your pride wants to say, oh, when they clean themselves up, that's when I'll love them, versus saying, no, 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 no. The grace of God has got enough for me and it's got a doggy bag for them so I can put that grace over them because I know what God has received. And you know what? In doing that, that's how we change the world. That's how we change the world. Because Peter couldn't have started the church in Acts chapter 2 if he hadn't denied Christ three different times. He wouldn't have been able, in Acts chapter 2 as it says, with many other words he pleaded with them. The church was started by a broken man who had received the grace of God and then had the capacity to give it to others. Here's the most amazing thing that I love about Jesus is there's no waiting period on the favor of God in your life. The moment we give our heart to Jesus, he makes us new that day, that day. You walk in his favor that instant. And so if you're walking out of alignment today, you are literally one prayer away from everything changing. And I'm not saying this as someone who's seen it in others. I'm saying as someone who God's doing it in me. And so if you could stand right here right now, I, I, I want to give everyone the opportunity to turn to Jesus. And the amazing part about the gift of salvation the, the gift of repentance, it, none of it's dependent on you. All of it's dependent on you surrendering pride and saying, I need help. I need Jesus. And he does all the work. He's literally paid the price for everything. Your sin, we've been talking about pride, but that is sin. Your sin separates your heart from the heart of your heavenly Father. God designed your heart to walk powered up by his presence each and every day. That's what Adam did when he was in the garden. He walked with God every single day. But sin severed that. Jesus paid the price so you could walk with Jesus again every single day. Jesus said that he'd give us the gift of the counselor, the Holy Spirit. And when we surrender our sin over to him, he gives us this Holy Spirit which rests and abides and lives in us and allows us to have a new fullness of life. Father, we come into your presence today and I pray for every single person in this room who wants to begin a relationship with Jesus, will they respond now? Repeat this prayer after me and for the benefit of those who are coming to God in this moment, we're gonna say this out loud together for their benefit. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I come to you, a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ paid the price for my sins. So today, I surrender my sin and receive your freedom.